let's talk today about Antarctica and the <coughs> management challenges that Antarctica presents. Obviously, Antarctica is at the South Pole. Unlike the North Pole, the South Pole has a continent, a landmass that underlays the ice and snow. We typically think about Antarctica as this uh, comma or apostrophe, right? Where there's this main circular part of the landmass, and then there's a little part of the apostrophe that comes up, that reaches up towards South America, Tierra del Fuego, and that's the so-called Antarctic Peninsula. We have this unique phenomenon that is present primarily because of the lack of landmass around 60 degrees latitude, south latitude. And that allows the waters to circulate, that allows the air to circulate, and in effect cut off from the rest of the, to, not completely, but, but to a large extent, cut off water mass, cut off air mass around the continent of Antarctica and uh, allows unique things to happen. The other unique thing is that this, um, this area creates, this is the so-called Antarctic Convergence, uh, the area be between the, the northern areas and the southern areas, this little, this little zone in here, and um, creates some of the craziest seas on the planet, the, the most crazy seas on the planet, right? As we mentioned before, uh, the water here is unlike anywhere else in the world where it can go around the globe and not encounter anything to break up its speed, not to, to break up the wind or to break up the water currents. And so it allows these huge movements to sort of feed upon themselves and feed upon themselves. And it has, in a sense, an infinite fetch, an infinite area upon which waves could build up. Here are the, here are the rough regions of Antarctica. The areas I'll just point out for you, to you guys in particular. Um, uh, you hear a lot about the Larsen Ice Shelf, which is right here. One of the reasons is that it's twofold. One is that it's on the peninsula, so it's a little bit away from the core of the Antarctic continent. So you hear about this as, in terms of uh, climate change and warming seas and, and uh, icebergs and things calving off and floating, floating around. So one, it, it's, it's farther away from the core, but then two, it's very near some long-term research bases, so it's relatively easy to study as compared to some other uh, segments of Antarctica. Again, I've put California on here for scale to give you guys a sense for how big we're talking about. Um, the red dots are the uh, permanent, important permanent bases. There's also some on the um, South Georgian Islands, but, but as far as the main continent of Antarctica, these are the important um, year-round bases. We have three. The U.S. has three permanent U.S. bases. There's Admins and Scott that's at the South Pole itself right here. And uh, because the ice sheet is moving, that station moves. And it moves a few feet every year. And so it's not exactly on the South Pole. So every year they move the flags. Everybody knows where the, the real uh, magnetic South Pole and geographic South Pole are. Um, and, then, uh, and then there's um, Palmer Station, the Antarctic Peninsula. So the pictures I show you that I took were from, from this area when I used to work out of this station. And then McMurdo. McMurdo is the third permanent US station. There are seasonal stations or seasonal camps that people use when it's warm enough and, and uh, to go out and maybe grab some penguin data or some other such thing. But for the US, those are the three permanent bases. Uh, to give you a sense, I don't have the most recent numbers, but when I used to go down there to give you a sense, um, uh, there's the austral summertime, the peak time when researchers are down there, and there's a the winter time. And so uh, when I used to go down there 15 years or so ago, uh, the uh, Palmer was maxed out at about 60 people or so, something like that. Um, South Pole was on the order of uh, 100 or, or so, 100, 150, something like that. And McMurdo was more like 1,200 people. So McMurdo has their own jail. They have, I think, two bowling alleys. So McMurdo is really, um, is the largest US base, and it's really a, a, a city. Um, right, okay, cool. Um, as we'll hear about uh, after we go through some of the ecology, uh, there are various claims that are laid upon the continent of Antarctica. We'll hear about the Antarctic Treaty 
as I said, in a bit. But for now, just note that there, there are human settlements scattered across the continent of Antarctica. All, all these little green dots on the left here are, um, are uh, bases. And then on the right, it's a little cartoon of some of the claims. We'll touch on that very briefly at the very end, uh, which certain countries uh, claim ownership of uh, parts of Antarctica, or, or at least claim mineral rights or something of that nature. Again, we have this, uh, the defining aspect of Antarctica is the ice and snow and is this notion of this uh, separation from the rest of the atmosphere. And yeah. So to, to give us a, a sense for the relative uh, ice cover, so this is the uh, maximum and minimum ice covers uh, in the last uh, couple years. And so what we see is on the bottom, we have Antarctica, obviously. So you can see that ice really grows, sea ice. So frozen seawater that, that is solid, becomes solid when it's cold, um, expands tremendously during the cold time of the year and shrinks tremendously during the warmer time of the year. The same phenomenon happens up at the North Pole, which is the, the uppermost uh, images, figures. And, uh, and as, we, as we mentioned before, uh, this is... Uh, there is no continent in at the North Pole, so when this ice melts, you can indeed travel across the, the North Pole. You don't need a submarine as we did with the Nautilus. You don't, you don't have to go subtital. You can actually go on the surface, and indeed, two weeks ago, we had the first uh, commercial cruise ship go from the Pacific into the Atlantic uh, through the um, open waters of, Antarct of the Arctic because of climate change and because of the melting sea ice. Same phenomenon, though. We have a seasonal expansion, seasonal shrinkage of sea ice. To illustrate the weather here, um, these are some of the weather plots from one of my trips that I just sort of stole or didn't steal. That's not right. I just I kept them because they were just recycle them. Um, but I think I really like these plots because they really show what the weather is like, right? They really show how how this Antarctic convergence, how this different atmosphere, surface water of the ocean um, is separated from the rest of the land. And you can see that with knowing, knowing nothing else, you can see the different in, difference in cloud cover here as we're going towards the Antarctic Peninsula and the area up towards the tip of South America. And you can see the winds are going really hard, but they're just, there's this sort of boundary up here and there's this chunk of stuff down here. Same thing here. Here we're seeing um, an eddy form, a cloud eddy, a storm kind of spinning off, if you will, um, because of the, the intense um, uh, winds, in this case, uh, of the two areas. Now, these seas are really crazy. They're quite dangerous. And so this is the, the boat that we used to go down, the, the Polar Duke, the RV Polar Duke. Um, and I don't really have a good picture of this because most of the trips, it's constant boom, 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 boom. So it's hard to get a, a crisp, clean picture. But large seas. So on the order of 40 to 60 foot waves were pretty common, quite challenging to navigate. In the context of coastal marine management, um, all kinds of stories there. But for example, one of which um, happened uh, during uh, one, of the, one of our night, one of the nighttime times of one of our crossings, when I went up to the bridge, and, and so the bridge is you know, lit up with red lights at night, and they have searchlights to see um, if there are icebergs around, so we don't accidentally run into an iceberg. Uh, and we listened to a, uh, a Philippine flagged cargo ship and they were calling for help. So we're going from here to here. And so we were somewhere, I don't know, somewhere in this vague vicinity. We started getting calls. And so this is nighttime and have a look at this. There's lots of clouds around, right? So when we look at this, it, it's, uh, it's hard to tell because of the light, but, but you can't necessarily see any stars, right? It's clogged in, it's socked in. So these guys are having problems, and as you guys are reading in your Will and Languishy book about um, the challenges of the modern shipping trade and flags of convenience and all this and that, this was, t this was totally manifested right here in that these guys are calling. Their ship is starting to take on water. They're starting to flood. And so they're calling on the radio, and so it's coming over the, the, the radio here, and they're saying, we're, we're sinking, we're losing power. And so then the Argentinian uh, Navy or Coast Guard, I can't remember, one of them is calling and they're saying, okay, where are you guys? And they said, we don't know, right? 
So they're, who knows, thousands of miles from any land. And, you know, storms, crazy winds are blowing. And they've lost power. And they're calling. And they're saying, help us, help us, help us. And, and the rescuers are trying to figure out if they can mount some kind of big, giant, you know, Sikorsky helicopter kind of thing or a plane or something. But they don't know where these people are. And they don't. And, and, and they had a position, but that was hours ago, and they floated, and they, they don't know where they are. And, and these guys, guys are just essentially crying on the line. It was very, very sad, very, very heart-wrenching. And they're saying, help us, help us, help us. Now the boat's starting to flood. Boat's starting to flood. You know, and, and the same these guys are he's calling. You know, where, does anybody see them? Anybody in the area? Any ship traffic? Do you guys see anything? Now these guys lose power. And so they're on, emerge, they're on battery power. So whatever lights they have on the, the bow and stern and stuff, they're probably not working. And they're calling, calling. And then eventually it just goes totally quiet. And don't know what ever happened to them. They, they, they're gone. They, they disappear. If you think about that, that's, that can happen here in the U.S. That happened just uh, uh, last year when we had the, the ship uh, go, moving up the coast of Florida at, Foolishly, during when a hurricane was coming and they sank, right? And those, those folks unfortunately died. But that's sort of a weird occurrence, right? That was, shouldn't have left port and this and that. And we had all these ships out looking for these folks and everything. This is a different part of the planet. This is a place where there isn't someone to necessarily come and save your butt. And it really is truly extreme. And it's like um, ye olden days, in a sense, of you have to be self reliant. And in our era, of increasingly you know, globalized shipping and increasingly um, homogenized shipping, we don't have folks that are maybe pure experts in Arctic or, or Antarctic navigating through ice. It's a dangerous place. These folks aren't maybe that well um, schooled in, in traveling in these waters. So a huge management challenge there, just purely getting people safely moved around in the Antarctic. Um, then, what? I was like, that's the story? Is there more to the story? They, they died. They, 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 yeah. Oh my God. Yep, that's it. So that's my illustration that this is not like a regular, it's not, this isn't the seas yeah. off of Southern California or anything. Sorry, I guess it was a bad really start. Corey didn't like my story. Sorry, Corey. Um, uh, so, okay, let's get back to the, 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 the key phenomenon here, which is dynamic sea ice. So changing sea ice is going to drive a huge amount of the ecology, it's going to drive a huge amount of the biological resources, and therefore it's going to drive a huge amount of the management challenge in this part of the world. So this is a, an amalgamation of um, uh, several years worth of data, but again, uh, this is the, the what's called the long-term ecological uh, restoration project that I used to work on. And, uh, and that's shown in a box where we typically have worked. And so the, the colors there represent the changing um, uh, number of days that it's possible to, to move through the water, you know, ice-free days. And so what we see is we're seeing changes and shrinkage in terms of um, the ice. Overall, over the last couple decades, we've seen a dramatically a period of dramatically less ice more and more commonly. So we're losing the period of ice. It's freezing. It takes, it takes uh, longer in the year for it to start to freeze. And then when it starts to melt, it melts quicker than it used to, used to, right? So the amount of ice on the sea surface at any given point is decreasing over the last several decades. And we see that in a whole host of, of measures. We see this at different stations. We see this with air temperature changes, et cetera. This also, as I mentioned, manifests itself in terms of not just the physical resources, but also the, the biological resources, the, thing that the things that respond to the environment. In this case, the penguins. So we see changes in the abundance of, of penguins uh, tending to favor more open water type of penguins in any one given area. Now, Antarctica is a, is a fantastic ecosystem, an amazing ecosystem, all kinds of wonderful parts, whales and things. I'll show you some pictures in a second. Um, it is um, 
uh, in a sense, though, constrained by these extremes of temperature. Therefore, it's been a very um, popular place to study. It's very expensive. It's hard to get there. Not many people can get there. But it's been a popular place uh, perennially over the last century because it is so extreme. So ecologists tend to like the intertidal, tend to like the, the Arctic and Antarctic, places that are extreme because you don't have a thousand million species. You tend to have the folks that are more hardy. And because, because of that, it's a little bit less complex. You don't maybe have a thousand different um, whale species. You maybe have a handful of whale species, th things like that. So it's a little easier logistically to get your hands around sometimes. But this is showing the, um, the relatively simplified food web of Antarctica. <clears throat> this is what Palmer Station looks like to give you a sense of, of what, uh, what you do. It's, uh, I, have, I have many stories I can tell you guys. If you guys want stories, I'll tell you guys stories later. But it's, um, it's not, it's, a, it's an outpost. It really is an outpost kind of thing. It's not like being at a big university or, or even a, uh, someplace like our research station on Santa Rosa. Much of the interesting biological resources, not all, but a lot of them are subtidal. And so these guys are drilling a hole in the ice to, to go sample. And it is really, it was fascinating to me the first time I went underwater because you look across the surface of the ice and it looks relatively flat. And you're thinking, this is pretty boring. It's, it's more or less pancakey. But as soon as you go under the ice, it's crazy. It's massively three dimensional. The bottom of the ice is nothing like the top of the ice usually. There's all, and you can, you can see a little bit in the hints of that in this picture, there's all this under rafting. And so on the top, it might be you know, a few feet of ice, let's say, and these guys are walking or working on the ice. But then below, it might be, a few, you know, might be relatively thin, or it might go down for you know, hundreds of meters of, of ice jumbled. And it's like walking through a cathedral. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, now, when we talk about resources that are there. We tip, the thing most people ask about are penguins, because most everybody knows that uh, you know, polar bears are in the North, North Pole, penguins are in the South Pole. So people want to know about penguins. So uh, penguins are cool. This is a rookery. This is a bunch of chicks. So the, so the ones on the left here, the black and white, those are adults. And the chicks there, and they're down, and they're in these areas. Um, everybody thinks, oh, that's so cool. There's, there's, there's a bunch of penguins. This is a penguin rookery. Um, it, is, it is crazy. It is extraordinarily loud. And it smells really, really, really bad. It's really, really bad poop mixed with sort of fish vomit. And it's just, man, it is, it's, it's a sensory overload. So these guys have been there for a while. And, and this, time of this, this time of the season, the, um, uh, the snow is melted. And so all that wonderful stuff <laughs> is now melted in the mud. And it's, so oh, good times, good times. Uh, this is perhaps more typically what people think about when they think about um, penguin rookeries is sort of nice snow. And they think of usually emperor penguins and stuff. Penguins are ornery critters, um, uh, but they're fantastic samplers. So penguins are eating all the time. It's cold. They have to eat. So these are some penguins we've caught and, uh, uh, and are, let's see, um, about to pump their stomachs. So these guys, their stomachs have not been pumped, so we're kind of holding on a little bit strongly. Um, they're very strong. So penguins are all muscle on their breast because all they do is this all day, like pat, pump, flap, 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 flap. So they're really, really strong. So these, so these guys um, can hurt when they flap you because the, the fore part of their flipper is a bone. But if, we had, if you had an adult emperor penguin, he can easily break your leg, whap, just smack you. So they're really, they're really uh, challenging. So, so uh, we would take them and we would, they, um, like our, uh, some of our other birds you might be more familiar with, lack a gizzard, they don't have a pouch here where they can macerate food. So therefore, it's a straight shot from their mouth into their stomach. So what we would do is we'd take um, a, paint, a paint pump and uh, get some seawater, warm it up in the microwave, and then catch these guys. And they're like, ah, and they're flapping around and all this and that. Um, and then uh, uh, pump the seawater into their stomach. And just like if I gave you a bunch of seawater in your stomach, you would get sick, right? So they kind of, and you, then you yank the tube out. And you put them upside down, and they, and they get sick, which is awesome because they're a, you can see exactly what they're eating. They don't have teeth. They don't crush up what they're eating. So it's, it's a perfect censusing of the food items that are out there. And I know this sounds crazy, 
but after that, then they don't fly, then they don't fight you as much. After like, ah, oh, they're kind of there in uh, like that guy. I'm not holding on him, right? So he's just like, ah. Uh. Um, but then I know this sounds not, this sounds crazy, but um, then when we're done, you let them go, and within five minutes, they're back to totally normal behavior. So the least impactful way to sample a penguins is what we just I just described to you. Um, when you take blood samples, when you do all these other things, they take a lot longer to recover their behavior patterns. These guys, within five minutes, are back feeding and they're going on along with them. I mean, they're probably like, right, that guy sucked. I'm not going to go back there. But, but it's not, there, there's, there's no um, long term danger or threat posed to these guys. Um, this is letting them off, go off the back of the, uh, back of the boat. Um, as I said before, these guys are going down, their populations are declining. And it's, uh, initially it wasn't clear why this was happening. So, so we'll talk more about this when we talk about um, whaling, uh, when we get into fisheries. But uh, the short version is here. we did a lot of extraction of biological resources in Antarctica, primarily whaling and sealing. So these vast stocks of whales, stuff, we harvested the heck out of them. Boom, 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 boom. And then as we'll hear uh, in, in a while, um, oh, we, by and large, stopped whaling, right? But the whales didn't necessarily all pop back. Similarly, uh, the seals that we've harvested, um, we, don't, we, don't harvest it, we don't harvest any seals now, even though some of the Japanese take some, some whales and stuff. We don't, nobody takes seals, in, in essence. But yet, some of those pinniped populations didn't bounce back. Some of these... Um, Penguins that we never really harvest. I mean, people would harvest them for food when they were hungry, but, but it wasn't like you know, a significant extraction. Those guys' numbers were decreasing. So that's what motivated the study. Why are these populations either decreasing or why have they not recovered like we think they would? Right? We've taken away the, the um, extraction pressure. We've taken away the harvest pressure. Why haven't these populations bounced back? Uh, a little bit about some of the organisms that are down there, some of the biological resources. This is my only picture of... There's four angiosperm species in the continent of Antarctica, four, four plants, and that's one of them. It's a crappy picture. Sorry, it's my only picture. Um, but that's, uh, that's a grass in the Antarctic Peninsula, one a species of grass they have down there. Um, on the right is um, a whale is just kicked, and he's just gone under. And you can just see, it's a minke whale. You can just see his fin. He just has kicked right here, so it's a big, a big uh, a footprint fin print, and then he's just about to kick down. So all kinds of wonderful uh, big things as well as small things. Massive productivity down there, as we discussed a, a little a couple weeks ago about the um, about salinity and things like that. Um, really cool stuff. This is um, an ice field, and what looks to be sort of dirty pink ice is actually um, uh, photosynthetic bacteria in the ice that are still able to function, even though they're quote unquote frozen. So some incredible productivity in some of these areas of Antarctica and some of the dry valleys and other places that um, are really amazing. Uh, then we have all kinds of uh, charismatic critters like this guy. We know what this is? Leopard. Yes, good, leopard, leopard seal. So I have a, I have a Story I can tell you guys, we don't have enough time right now, but if you want me, to, if you guys are interested sometime, we're waiting for some, some tour or something, you guys can ask me to tell you about the leopard seals and, and crab eater seals. But basically, these guys are really aggressive. Um, they have big canines. So one of my friends has a scar on her knee because this guy, uh, one of these guys tried to uh, eat her. Uh, one of these guys ate a Mark V Zodiac. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but basically a big inflatable Zodiac, he just sort of ate it, just ar ar ate the rubber and just pulled the whole thing under. Is there a video on this, that photo of this guy? Of this guy, there might be. So th this is this is when this, this photographer was uh, shooting some photos and normally this is a dangerous thing, you wouldn't want to be in the water, but this guy uh, went and brought up a dead penguin to this photographer to say, hey, are you my friend? Hey, would you like a penguin? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, crazy stuff there. Um, uh, so again, that's a leopard seal on the upper left, and then a crab eater seal on the lower right. So um, uh, supposedly, the one on the upper left is a dangerous one. The one on the lower right is not dangerous, but uh, I found I, I had a different experience. Um, so, so all kinds of pinnipeds, things like that, but also fantastic invertebrates in Antarctica. So this is a jellyfish with a bell about a meter in diameter, 
And these are a bunch of amphipods that are on here feeding on, essentially eating up the jellyfish. Crazy stuff, amazing stuff, beautiful stuff. Um, uh, this is not my photo, but a photo of a friend of ours that, um, uh, again, really crazy um, life down there. Some things that are down there, we are not wholly unknown to us, but they can behave quite differently. So in this case, this is a salp, this is a tunicate. This looks like an individual, but these guys oftentimes down in Antarctica form colonial chains. So this guy is essentially an autonomous unit, but he will typically be attached to a guy that's here, to another one, to another one. And I've seen these guys make corkscrews, like DNA, DNA spirals, if you will, that are maybe a meter in diameter that go, you know, dozens of meters and really, really crazy stuff. So cool, um, cool inverts. Then of course we have fish like ice fish, uh, petrels and all kinds of uh, birds. Almost all these guys are, oh, then we have all kinds of cool benthic things like these, <clears throat> these bat stars. And this, this picture is from uh, McMurdo Station. So it's relatively shallow where we typically dive. It's very, very deep, but this is, uh, this is some of the shallows. Um, by the largest U.S. base. Um, and then there's, there's it's, the waters are very productive. So there's lots of biomass down there. Um, and in this case, this is a, a trawl from the bottom where the net went down and dragged on some stuff and there's all kinds of crabs and urchins and, and everything down there. Uh, one other example of the, the amazing lack of knowledge of this place is this. So this is a, a little trawl I did and it looks like not a whole lot to you guys. You're looking at it and it looks most like water. It's hard to see. Um, but there's actually all kinds of little baby shrimp in here and all kinds of stuff. And you can see what looks to be uh, uh, gray on the bottom of the dish it are these gelatinous, zoopla these gelatinous plankton and the light is casting a shadow. So when you look at them, you might not see anything, but as soon as you scoop the water and look closely, there's tons of stuff. So that's uh, a friend of mine. Uh, who's now the diving safety officer for UCLA and San Diego State, and we're looking at this a tank of um, tinafores, because I like tinafores, um, and uh, just crazy cool stuff. So uh, one day we're out there doing a trawl, and we're trying to get krill. We were working on, on the shrimp, the euphousid shrimp that everybody eats down there. It's the base of the food web. And so uh, we pulled up some stuff, and I pulled up uh, these things, which are totally crazy. So this is this bizarre polychaete that was blood red and constantly folding over itself. It looked like some kind of weird alien thing. Super crazy cool. And then hard for you guys to see in this picture, but this thing is a ketignath, also known as an arrow worm. And uh, really, really cool. It's got this blue plate. So this is, this is you, in our waters here off California, these guys will be really small. These guys will be like maybe the you know, width of your fingernail or something like that, very, very thin, small. They have bristles on the top of their head that they spear things and they eat they eat larval fish and things this guy was huge this guy was massive and he had this incredibly beautiful blue plate that ran through his body that didn't look i don't know how it worked but it looked looked fake but it was it was crazy so i have these things I'm like this is awesome and we would do these shifts like like 12 hours on 12, uh, eight hours off or something and um and so i finished my shift and i said and i went and i asked the, the the head professor guy run the ship, the principal investigator said, hey, so what, what is this? I don't know. I haven't seen something like that. Okay, cool. So I go to the books and I get the books and all the guides and the species list. Pfft, nothing like this, this crazy um, uh, Ketignath. I'm like, that's awesome. And so the, the, the PI says, you should describe it. You get to name, if it's a new species, you get to name it. Awesome. So I come back and I'm like, this is awesome. And so I have this and I put this, in, put these guys in an ice bath so they're okay and they're, and I'm sketching them on my book, like, this is awesome, like, science is cool. And then um, I hadn't slept in a long time, so I was kind of hungry. So I went and I went to get a soda and some popcorn. And I come back from the galley, and I'm looking like, where's my, uh, where's my stuff? They said, what? I said, where's, where's, where's the, the worm in the, in the, the heating net? And my friend, that, that guy, who's the diving safety officer, now, he says, uh, what are you talking about? He said, you know, the, 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 the stuff I was sketching. Like, no, the only thing that was here was this bottle of, like, this thing of empty water, and lame water. I said, what did you do? Said, we moved it. I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. Just tell me, where'd you move it? We threw it off the back of the boat. And I said, what? He goes, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, did you want it? They're like, oh, my God, dude, I could have been famous, and you ruined my chance to be famous. So, so Antarctica is truly a place like that. You guys might hear about things like the rainforest that you go into, 
that, oh my God, there's things that have never been discovered, never been named, or never been cataloged. Antarctica is that kind of place. We talked about the deep sea, right, uh, before, and that's an amazing place. Antarctica is also a crazy amazing place. So if you guys ever get the chance, I strongly encourage you guys to go check it out. But as we're learning, it's a place of, it's, it's a dangerous place. It's a place of huge diversity. It's a place of a lot of challenges. So the challenges are not just for the animals that we throw off the back. This is a, a cruise ship that sunk um, uh, relatively recently. So there's, there's dangers not just to commercial folks, but to everybody going down there. Um, uh, challenges, as we mentioned, for the wildlife in terms of this changing, uh, changing area. These are some whales in a, in, a, in a rent in the sea ice. And here are some orcas coming on and eat some stuff because they're hungry. So next I want to mention some of the ice and some of the, the, the diversity of ice, which is going to drive a lot of the different uh, biological resources. This is our ship, uh, the Polar Duke. And check out the ice. The ice is um, lumpy right now. It's called pancake ice. Um, oh, well, I guess I'm going to tell you something different first. Okay, so, so here's krill. So everything revolves around this guy. Krill, Euphausia superba. Everything eats this guy. The fish eat this guy, the birds eat this guy, the whales eat this guy, everybody eats this guy. Everybody, everybody, everybody. It's, it's an incredibly foundational component of the Antarctic food web. We have been looking at krill for a little while. So here's a trawl, some guys down there in, 19, in the 1930s uh, doing trawls to see how many of these individuals are down there. Here's a map from 1962 where people have plotted the distribution. So knowing nothing else, if you guys look at this map, it's clear that there are some areas that have a lot of krill and other areas with less krill. And so the question becomes, hey, why, why are they where they are? Um, here's krill respond, doing essentially the experiment that we did uh, a couple weeks ago with different, uh, with frozen sea ice. So this is, Here's some krill. We've taken some algae they like to eat, frozen them, just like we did in the refrigerator, but we put some flores a special kind of dye called fluorescein dye that glows bright green when it comes into contact with seawater. And so here are the, here's how these guys eat. So they're cruising around. Choo -choo -choo -choo. This is the pictures in a tank. Cruising around. Choo -choo -choo. Oh my God, what's that? He smells this. Oh my God, and then he follows the scent trail up. And so again, this is, this is this brine, you guys know what this is now, right? This hyper brine trail of, of super dense seawater that's, that's rocketing out, rocketing out of the ice as it melts, these brine pockets. And so this guy's smelling this, he goes, I, I, I smell some, some algae. And so he cruises on up like this guy, he goes to the bottom of, in this case, the ice cube, but it would be the iceberg or the undersea ice. And he grabs, 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 and then boom, he grabs it. So he's now ripped off this chunk of algae, and he's stoked. He's going to go mack on that. So the key driver of the dynamics of these guys are the melting, is the melting ice. The melting ice is key. The melting ice is going to provide a smorgasbord of food for these guys. This algae that's up in here, this algae is not dead. This algae has survived. This algae has essentially antifreeze for fluid. So even though it's in the ice, it, it may be, in effect, almost completely dormant, but it's not dead. As soon as it thaws out, it goes on, actively divides, uh, and continues its lifespan. So this melting of the ice every year is this huge pulse of chlorophylls, this huge pulse of energy, is this huge pulse of food for these guys huge pulse of food for these guys, then no surprise, it's a huge pulse of food for the folks that eat the krill. Everybody with me? All right, cool. Questions so far? Am I boring everybody? Um, uh, the way we take a look at, at stuff, we haven't talked about this yet. We have, I haven't shown you guys some of the instruments for physical oceanography, but these are some of the instruments. Um, on the left, this is called a rosette, like a rosette of flowers. And these are tubes, these are big giant tubes each one of which can be triggered remotely. There's a big cage you lower down into the water, into the ocean, and there's, there's electrical sensors on here so we can measure salinity and things like that. But then at the right amount of time, we can push a button and trigger this valve to close, cha-chunk, and trigger this valve to close, cha-chunk. So 
So typically what we do is we send this thing down. This will go down maybe a kilometer, maybe two kilometers straight down. And as we're going down, we're measuring the thermoclines, right? The pycnoclines, all these different, different masses of water. And so as it going down, this, uh, the, a scientist there is going like, mm, that's interesting. This seems to be water mass one. This seems to be water mass two. This seems to be water mass three, et cetera. And then, and then when we pull the, pull the array back up, when we get into that area, like, I want, I want, let me give me some water from water mass two. Push a button, to chunk and it grabs that water. Now that water is in this isolated uh, thermos, basically, in insulated, isolated thermos, and it's cut off from the rest of the seawater. It's perfectly sealed. So then it comes to the surface, and then these guys can pull, this, pull each of these off and go into the lab and measure very detailed, uh, or take very detailed chemical characterizations of that water mass. And you can, you can understand what's going on, and this is these guys launching it from the back of the Polar Duke. Uh, and that's how we do net toes. Similar. We haven't talked about that, but this is essentially how we do a trawl. This is a plankton toe. So in this case, all it is is a big net, and it's got a net, and then it goes down to smaller and smaller nets, smaller and smaller nets, and then it goes to a little end with a fine mesh, and you can filter out critters the size you want. And so when you drag it back on, the, on board, you have uh, critters the size you want, and the smaller things have, have flushed through and gone out. Um, and that's about diving. Uh, you guys don't care about diving. That's me going in the water. Yeah, those are dry suits. So, um, so this is us waiting to get picked up when the boat comes to pick us up. Um, but this is what it looks like under the ice. I don't, I don't really have any good pictures that I took under the ice, um, but it's really amazing. It, it's it's multicolored. It's hard to explain. There's purples and blues and browns and greens, all about the thickness of the ice and how much algae is frozen in that ice all totally coloring like a stained glass window very cool stuff and that's me and that's what the boat looks like when it's cold. okay so enough of that um ice ice is very dynamic so here's one of our vessels going through um, a really beautiful uh, chunk of um, of breaking up sea ice we have different sources of ice the ice on the right up there that looks like rock that looks like black is streaked through it that is from a glacier. That is ice that was part of a glacier on land as that glacier moved and rubbed <laughs> on the bottom of the, of, of the surface of the ground, it picked up some dirt. It got some dirt rubbed into it. It got some more dirt rubbed into it. And then maybe it snowed onto it and all this and that. So this, so this striation is indicative of this ice. Even though it's floating in the ocean, it did not form in the ocean. So we have two main categories of ice. We have um, shore ice or fast ice, meaning, meaning ice that, that, that's come from the land, broken off from a glacier, something like that, stuff associated with that. So glacier ice, let's just call it glacier, glacial ice, and then sea ice. So something like this guy, this surface, so, so this big giant iceberg, that was, that was a, a glacier that, that calved off. It fell into the water and now it's floating around. This stuff, was created by just very, very cold atmospheric temperatures, freezing the uppermost, you know, a couple millimeters of, of seawater, and then it freezes a little bit more, a little bit more. So we have frozen seawater versus big, thick chunks of ice that uh, come from uh, glaciers. Uh, some of this stuff can be quite huge. So this is, this is also glacialized. Another key to something being glacialized, if you look at it, it looks blue. It doesn't look white. As, as we talked about earlier, when we freeze stuff, our ice cubes look really white because they have what's inside of there? Air, all these air bubbles. This stuff, the air has all been squeezed out of by the weight, essentially, over millennia of this weight pushing down. And so this stuff is, it takes a much longer time to melt. Um, more ice, sea ice on the left. Um, sea ice and then a big glacier up in the background. More guys, okay. All right, so we talked about the dynamics of this stuff. So these are some satellite images showing what I just described. This is, um, on the right, this is going through, this is stepping through some different time periods. And what we see here, and so this black represents a cloud in the way, so the satellite couldn't get a good image. But the color, um, what are we seeing? We're seeing, this, this is false infrared, this is chlorophyll A. 
the speed image. So the hotter the color here, the more chlorophyll in the surface. And you can read that as the more algae in the surface, surface water. So what's going on here is we're seeing this ice retreat, the ice edge retreat, boom, 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 boom. And it, it's a big flush of food, right? So boom, we see these big flushes and this guy flushes, boom. And then he kind of starts to die back. And then we see these, these, these secondary explosions, boom, boom, of productivity. And it's just boom, 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 going off with the um, austral spring each year. So we mentioned before, the sea ice is, is declining. And that's been the motivation for a lot of these studies. <coughs> I think we're going to take a quick five minute break. I think you guys need to stretch. I think I'm boring you guys. I think you're, uh, I think you're starting to fall asleep or something. Um, so uh, I'll just note that we have different increasing pressure to extract things like krill and things like fish, things like Patagonian toothfish and stuff. And we have different management areas. In this case, these are some of the areas uh, that are uh, represented by some of the UN FAO. For us, for us in the US, we have fantastic data on most of our fisheries. Most of the planet, we don't have that same quality of data. The global unifier of fisheries data is the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO. And that's the entity that tries to standardize stuff and make apples talk to apples and, and have some kind of consistency. So what I'm showing you here are some of the management areas that are designated by that global um, uh, fishery uh, inventory group and, and management.